It has been a rough year for most of us. And to be honest, it has been a tough couple of years for many of us. The pandemic took the existing problems in our schools and magnified them. And that has led to many teachers quitting or many teachers on the verge of leaving their classroom. The problem is real and the teacher shortage is just the beginning. And if you're a teacher, you know exactly what I'm talking about. In this video, I'm gonna break down the 10 biggest reasons why teachers are leaving the profession. Now, I've been teaching for 19 years and I have experienced most, if not all of these issues. But I don't wanna leave it just there. I wanna take it to the next level and I wanna give you some words of encouragement. I wanna let you know how I overcame these issues. But first, let's go ahead and play that intro. one teachers are overworked and burnt out this is so true i mean the reality is we're not just teachers we're counselors we're nurses we're janitors we're even parents many of the times we can have up to 35 kids in our classroom and we're expected to meet all of their needs their learning needs their social emotional needs it's it's just so overwhelming when we're not in front of the students, we're expected to do grading, call home, attend meetings. The list goes on and on and on of all our job duties. The NAA took a survey of why teachers are leaving the profession, and this was the number one reason why they were considering leaving, was once again, the overworked and burnt out part of it. So if you are feeling overwhelmed, you gotta know you're not alone. 80 something percent of teachers are feeling the exact same way you are. This job is emotionally draining and so time consuming. But here's the other reality. Teaching is extremely rewarding. And with the right routines in place, you can make your life a little easier and you start getting some of your time back. My first couple of years were so draining. If you watch any of my previous videos, you know this. The first seven years of teaching just broke me down. But eventually, I started learning things. Eventually, I started putting things in place. And eventually, I started becoming better at my craft. And I was able to relieve a lot of that stress and get some of my time back. The other thing I would highly recommend to do is start supporting your teacher's union. I have the fortune of working with uh, our union president. And I can tell you, she bust her butt for us. And the things that she have done and the union leadership has done, um, they have definitely given us uh, more opportunities to be successful. So please support your teacher's union as well. There's power in numbers, and with a stronger union, you can see more changes. Number two, the kids in my classroom are out of control. If you talk to almost any teacher this year, that is the first thing you'll hear them say regarding their classes. I am currently teaching eighth grade social studies, and man, the stories I can tell you, you can fill up 10 books regarding behavior issues. I've had students spit in my classroom, fights break out, students throwing milk across the room, students threaten to fight me, the list goes on and on and on. And as much as the pandemic has led to many erratic behaviors, I can honestly tell you these past three years have actually been some of my best years in all my years of teaching. Now, it's not necessarily because the students have gotten better, but it's because I've gotten better at my craft. I've started tweaking things here and there, started making some changes, and by doing that, I have made my classroom a better place for the students as well as myself. So here's the ray of hope in that little golden nugget. The longer I've been teaching, the better I've gotten at my classroom management, and so can you. Number three, administration is not supportive. This is a huge one. I can pinpoint different points in my career where I had better years and worse years, and they seem to correlate exactly with the principle I had at that time period. And when it comes to curriculum, dealing with parents, dealing with students, a, a supportive administration can either make it or break it for you. I was just talking with a friend of mine who just made Chief Master Sergeant in the Air Force. And I was joking with him that now he gets to go to meetings and just boss people around. But what he said actually started to make me think. He says, no, what his job is, and what he does every day is he walks around for those people that are below him rank wise and doing the job work and he basically asks them how he can make their life easier and then he'll attend the meetings and try to convince those higher ups on getting the supplies need or whatever their changes need to make the people that he is working for life easier and i thought man that is a great way of looking at leadership and my experience is that is what makes a great principal, a principal that is there to help out the teachers do their job to the best of their ability. Fortunately for me, I currently have a principal, vice principal, and a dean of students that work extremely hard and have our backs. And for the record, 
I would not want to have their jobs. But if you're not fortunate to have that administration in place, here's what I recommend. Hang in there, because chances are that you might have a new principal within a matter of a couple years. I've, I've just counted into my head here, and, I, and I've been teaching 19 years, and I think in that time period I've had nine principals, nine different principals. That means I had a new principal on average about every three years. So if your current administration does not have your back, hang in there. There's a good chance within the next couple of years, you'll have a new principal and hopefully that person will be a better leader and support you and your fellow teachers. Number four, teachers don't get paid enough. I thought a lot about this one and I did a lot of soul searching because I have heard all those studies where they say that, you know, someone with the same kind of education as teachers have, they make a lot more money. And I look at those and, and, and those numbers from what I can tell are accurate. Uh, most professions make more money than teachers do. And I know for me to make up the difference in pay, uh, I've throughout the years, I've taken on different duties, different jobs. I, I teach summer school, I teach night school, I cover classes, um, all these different things I've done to bring in extra money. So I know we don't get paid as most other professions with the same kind of education. But I like to look at the bright side. And here are some of the things that make teaching great. One is uh, the time off. I mean, we do get paid less, but we do get a lot more time off as well. So that's definitely a benefit. There are not many other jobs out there where you can spend the holidays guaranteed with your kids. Another thing is job security. I remember when the pandemic started, uh, many people up there were, were fearful of losing their jobs because of the economy and everything else going on. Uh, but for me, I had the relief of knowing my job was secure. So that job security uh, is something that you can't just put to the wayside. Uh, in times of a horrible economic crisis, it's nice that you know you can rely back on your job. It boils down to this. You never become wealthy being a teacher. There, there's a limit how much money you can make as a teacher. I mean, there's a pay scale. That's part of the predictable thing. It's part of security. It's a pay scale that goes up every year. And you'll know exactly how much money you'll make at how many years you've been teaching. So you never become rich. But the other side of it is you have that job security. You also have that days off that many professions don't have. And I mean, you don't overlook this one here. You actually have the chance of making a huge difference in the lives of many of your students. So teaching may not be the best job because there's this huge learning curve, but I would argue that it's definitely one of the better professions out there if this is something you're gonna do long term. Number five, students have a short attention span. Let's be honest, it's not just students that have a short attention span. I believe we all have shorter attention spans than we had five, 10, 15, 20 years ago. That's just the way society is. I mean, how many times are you in your TikTok or your Instagram and how many times will be a conversation going on and your mind drifts somewhere else? I just think that's how we are as people today, as society, is we all have shorter attention spans. So it's nothing I would pinpoint exactly to my students. But I do know this, when it comes time to focus on longer things, I can do it. I just have to make it a priority and I have to focus my attention on it, but I can focus on things for longer periods of time. And so can my students. I think about my son, he can spend days in front of his computer or his gaming system playing the hours away. So he can focus on things that are important to him. And so can our students. They just have to make the choice. So in my classroom, I hold my students to that expectation. And I hold my students uh, to that bar of expecting them to rise to the point where they need to focus for long periods of time. And there are times in my class where students that focus long periods of time. Now, just like any other teacher, I try to chunk down the information and break it down to smaller parts, uh, just as anybody would like to have in a classroom. Um, but I do know and I truly believe that they can rise to that level of focus. So even though students may have a shorter attention span than before, that is nothing that would hold them back from being successful at school. Number six, new programs and we're always testing. When I first started teaching, I was told to teach the stuff that will be on the test, but don't teach to the test. But once I started to understand the game of testing, here's what I realized they were saying is teach to the test, but try to make it look like you are not. I mean, the reality is this, 
Um, testing is a necessary evil. And I understand that testing is a necessary evil. But let's be honest. Let's call it a spade a spade. Testing is there and we have to recognize it is not going away anytime soon. But what really gets me is that they're always introducing new programs with the hopes of improving testing. Once again, when I was a new teacher, I would have the old teachers coming up to me and saying, yeah, we did this 15 years ago. They're just renaming it and putting a new package on it, but it's the same exact thing we did 15 years ago. And I thought there were just some old grumpy teachers. But now I've been teaching 19 years, I realize that's exactly what happens. Uh, it's a new program, right? It is a new program, but the reality, we've seen this before. It's maybe some new words, some new vocabulary, new labels, um, but once again, it seems like there's cycles in education and what worked before goes away, comes back, and we try it again in a different form. That is just the game of all these new programs coming out. So what I did was instead of getting frustrated by all these new programs, I just realized exactly what they were. And I honestly believe that all these new programs coming out are with a good purpose. And the people introducing these new programs, um, they have good intentions for the students. So I don't get frustrated by this anymore because I know the intentions are good. But on the same thing, I don't hang my hat on that new program 100% because I know just in a few years, it may go away. Number seven, this generation of students are, and just fill in the blank. Where do we start with this one? This new generation of students are lazy. This new generation of students are apathetic. This new generation of students are entitled. This new, you name it, this new generation of students, you put anything you want there. But my honest belief is, I think this generation of students is just like we were when we were their age. I mean, think about this for a second. Have you heard, I know I've heard, when I was younger, uh, my parents saying kids these days, right? And chances are your parents said kids these days. It's easy to make these blanket statements about students, but when I really dive into the students in my class, I realize that they have the same hopes and dreams I had at their age. But when I look at the individual actions of many of my students, I'm amazed by their compassion, I'm amazed by their thinking, I'm amazed just by the people that they are. I have so many stories of great things my students have done, and those things give me hope that future generations will take this country we have and make it an even better place. Number eight, no consequences for students. Now, I work in California. As far as states go in the USA, California is one of the more liberal states. I have worked 18 of my 19 years in the same district, and I'm currently working at a Title I middle school uh, where I believe at least 60% of the students are below poverty level. So this is what I've known for 18 years, and I often think, is it different somewhere else? Is it different in another district? Is it different in another city, another state, or even another country? And I, to be honest, I really don't know the answer to that. All I know is what it's like where I live in my district. And I can honestly tell you um, that I've seen the consequences for the students um, slowly start to go away. Now, once again, I don't know if this is a district thing, a state thing, or, or a country thing, um, but the consequence, the trend I see is that there's less and less consequences for severe behavior. And that has me concerned. So the best thing I can do is try to make sure I do the best job I can providing structure in my classroom. Now, inevitably, uh, stuff that happens outside my classroom is gonna leak into my classroom. If I can keep that structure, those boundaries in my classroom, and I can at least help out the majority of my students, and for the majority of my students, for 90% of my students, I can provide them the best education learning environment possible. Nine, parents are not supportive. When I call home, I'm hoping to get that parent that says, I am sorry that my son or daughter acted that way in your class. I will take care of it when they get home. The majority of the time I call home, no one even picks up. And then when I, someone does pick up, more often than not, I hear this. I said, yeah, I'm having trouble with them at home too and I just don't know what to do. You don't know what to do. I mean, you're the parent, help me out here. So when I do call home looking for parent support, I'm not surprised if there's not much they can do to help me. If they do, that is awesome, that is incredible, and I will take that. But I don't go calling home with the expectation that things are going to change. 
I used that opportunity to inform the parents of what's going on in the classroom and then what I did to deal with it. Now, if you do call home and you get that parent that is combative, the best advice I can have for you is try not to engage with that. If they're combative, if their response is, well, what did you do to make my son or daughter act the way? You're not gonna win that argument. You're just not going to. So if you call home, you don't get that support, don't be surprised, but whatever you do, just make sure you don't engage in a combative relationship with the parents. Your job is mainly to inform them what's going on and if they are able to provide help, then take it. Number 10, I don't think this job is for me. This is where you need to break down, do some soul search and really dive into why this job is not for you. If this job is not for you because your administration is not supportive, well, we talked about that. Chances are in a few years, they're going to be gone. If this job is not for you because uh, it's not worth the pay, that's a reality. But once again, if you're in this for the long term, my belief is um, that it is a worthwhile profession to be in. So just really figure out why this job is not for you. If it's because the students are out of control in your class, then focus on that classroom management. I have numerous videos on my channel that talk about classroom management. So please look at one of those and maybe they will help out. But if you've been doing this job for a couple years and you realize this job is not for you, that is 100% understandable. It takes years to figure out what exactly is and this job is not for everybody. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that at all. You're not a bad person uh, for wanting to quit teaching. And don't let anybody ever tell you that you're a bad person for wanting to quit teaching. A lot of times it's, you know, how about the students? How about this? The reality is it is your life. And if you're not called to do this, then find out what you're passionate about. Find out where your calling is and focus your energies on 